Welcome everyone to Wealth Talks. It's an, Wealth Talks is an investment forum produced by Victoria Mutual Wealth Management, a member of the Victoria Mutual Group. Are you unsure about what is happening with your portfolio? You know, trying to figure out who can you reach out to help you? Um, what should you be doing as an investor to get answers? You know, what questions should you be asking? Um, then if those are the questions that you have, then you're, you've come to the right place. Through this webinar, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to explain, you know, who an investment advisor is or a wealth advisor, or financial advisor, they're all kind of, um, you know, similar um, terms. And, you know, what are some frequently asked questions that you as, you know, investors may have for wealth advisors, just so you can get to understand and, um, you know, learn how to fully leverage, you know, your, your wealth advisor or the access that you have to your wealth advisor. So, you know, first, obviously the first question people are going to have is who is a wealth advisor? So before we get to that, let's just introduce Peter Gay, Russell Peart who is a senior wealth advisor for VM Wealth. So welcome, um, Peter Gay. Thanks, Mark. So, and you have significant experience in banking and in um, investment, investment advising and all that stuff, generally speaking. So, so I, I'd love to, to jump right into it. Um, what exactly is a wealth advisor? Or who is a wealth advisor and what do they do? What can they do for me? Okay, so a wealth advisor is someone who is licensed by the FSC. Mm -hmm. The FSC is the Financial Service Commission, right. right? So that person is licensed by the FSC, meaning that they're legally um, able to give financial advice as to how to grow your portfolio, how to get started with a portfolio, how to build your wealth, create that wealth, and sustain that wealth, mm -hmm. right? How a wealth advisor is important and how a wealth advisor can be useful to you is that that information that we give to our clients is very very important because we are able to help you to make sound financial decisions okay right? okay all right so i guess the, the kind of premise is that me as a as a novice investor or a new investor but actually not even just a novice or a new any investor any investor you right. guys um as an investment advisor you work within you know the, the, um a, a larger entity so you have access to a lot more information that right. I may have, for and example, and exactly, and research. And, exactly resources and, and research. And right. so your your goal is to kind of um, help me, you know, kind of distill the information that I need according to my goals to help me achieve my goals. Correct? Right. That's correct. Okay. All right. Great. Um, so, so you know, so obviously, you know, one of the things that, all right, so we've heard all that and that's great. And for clarity, the FSC is the regulator for the entire regulator industry. Regulator for the industry, right. right. And the reason is because they don't want, you know, any and everybody any, right. giving investment so it, advice. So we must be governed right. by somebody, right? Exactly. That will set up protocols that we must follow. Right. Right. Okay, exactly. And, oh, and sorry, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Mark Gale from Finance Twitter JA. You can, you know, check me out on Twitter at Mark Gale. But one of the most common questions I get, the reason I spoke about that FSC thing and I really drilled down into it a little bit, is because people always come to, to me and ask me, and not just me, but other people on Finance Twitter, you know, asking us questions, what stocks should we buy, you know, what should we invest in, whatever. And our, the default response is, we are not licensed financial advisors, right. so we can't give that advice, right. but you are. Right, and I'm happy that you brought that up right. because I am aware of finance Twitter, right. Right? right? And I know that a lot of person is always going on Twitter, they're always saying this and they're saying that, and as you rightfully said, you are not licensed right. to give that kind of um, information right. or advice, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I'm aware of your movement that you have going on <laughs> on Twitter, right? right? And I know that you are pretty much reserved with some stuff that you would tweet or advice right. that you would give. Yeah. And and what I would say is that if you're really looking for that financial advice or financial solution, you need to speak to an investment advisor or a wealth advisor right. so that you can have the correct information. Right. Because what I find is that because Twitter is saying, oh, this stock is a good stock and then everybody starts saying oh this stock is a good stock and if you ask them okay so what is the PE ratio right nobody can tell you that right, right, if, the, right. if you if you ask um so why are you interested in this stock what what what, what do you think is the long-term um plan for this company do you think that this company balance sheet can carry um a certain amount of weight or right. can they 
sustain through a pandemic like what we are going through right now right. and nobody can tell you yeah i mean so so to be fair so i i, I agree with what you're saying in the mm -hmm. sense that you know we do need to be careful um and you know so one of the benefits to the hashtag is that anybody can can chime in right, right. so we do see people you know um saying all a variety of different things but you know just you know the core group of us you know we're very very clear that okay we're here to kind of like um, educate guidance. people right. exactly and just generally give guidance and and kind of like help you like understand like okay what exactly is a pe ratio how to use it when do you use it you know so on right. but i think that you know the role of an investment advisor is very very crucial because Correct. you know one of the things that we can't do and don't do is that we can't sit down with somebody or you know communicate with somebody and determine okay how old are you? How much income do you make? What are your retirement goals or what are your financial goals? Right. And therefore set up a plan, which is something that you guys can do. Right. right. So, all right. So now that we've kind of like covered that, how do we, or how does the average person get started investing? Um, how much money do they need and what do they invest in first? So I assume a beginner. A beginner. Okay. Yeah. So let's use this example. Right. A beginner, they don't know anything about investment, right? Um, might not so might not be so clear about what their goals are, what they're trying to achieve. But mm -hmm. they, the one thing that is constant is that they know that they they they, they want to start investing, right? right? And right. I think that is the very first step. At least mm -hmm. you know that I need to start investing, right? right? So that for me is the very first step. Mm -hmm. You know within yourself that it is time mm -hmm. for me to start investing. And I always say to clients that the time is no. Right. Absolutely. So you don't want to put it off and say, um, let me wait until January. Right. <laughs> it's a new year and I right. set new resolutions. Yeah. Or I wait until I'm 30 mm -hmm. or when I get some bonus. Right. No. Or wait until I have a million dollars. Or wait until I have a million dollars. Right. Or wait until I get a lump sum right. or some exactly. payout from my company. No. Right. You want to start now. Right. So can I start? Like what what's the is there a right. minimum? Or? Right. So you can start now. And the minimum is ten thousand Jamaican okay. dollars. Okay. Not many brokerage houses mm -hmm. um give you that minimum okay. startup, right? Right. Most places is a lot higher, mm -hmm. like say five hundred thousand a million. Mm -hmm. But what VM World emphasizes is financial inclusion. Right. So we want to ensure that each person can get a chance to start their financial journey, mm -hmm. right? So the minimum to start is 10,000. Mm -hmm. Pretty much what you will need is a ID, TRN, which if you have a driver's license, that will cover that. Right. Proof of address, which is like any utility bill, a bank statement, and or anything that bears your name. It could be a, a mail that comes in the post. Right. But what, what if I'm a student and I don't have a utility bill? Or something? So if you're a student, we mm -hmm. can use your student ID. Okay. Right. We can use your student ID. Mm -hmm. And what we could do is have like your parent mm -hmm. verify your address for you or a, or a, a letter from a justice, justice of the peace. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. Okay. And then, so, and, and I mean, I mean, I know that this may be, you know, kind of like, you know, outside of you guys' hands in terms of from a regulatory perspective, because, you know, honestly, like one, another piece of feedback that I always get is, oh my gosh, it's so draconian just to even get started. Just get open started. an account, right. you know, I, I need my liver and, you know what I mean, blood type and all these things. Yes, but, I've seen that. I've right. seen that on, especially on Twitter, I've seen that. But it's right. not so difficult to get started, really. Right. Once you have an ID, right. right, which is pretty much, you need that for any business that you're going to transact, right? right? Once you have an ID, you must have a TRN that's mandated now. Mm -hmm. The proof of address is where a lot of persons may run into issues because some persons may not have a bill mm -hmm. that comes in their name, but um, I'm sure that you must have like a bank account, okay. even a savings account. You can't pull on the statement and right. use that as a proof and of address. And I guess address. all of that is just because, you know, the regulators are the trying regula to prevent right. money laundering and right. stuff like that. So we okay. know what is happening around us. So yeah. I've, I've always um, told clients that it's not we trying to be intrusive. Are right. we trying to find out every bits and, and details of your life? It's just that we are governed by this body and we are governed by these rules. Right. So therefore, we must follow those. And and, and for me, I think that's pretty simple. Right. It's okay. not a lot that we're asking of you. Yeah. So what do I invest in first? You know. So new beginner. You know, I come in. I have my ten thousand dollars. I have my ID. What's the first thing that I invest in? All right. And I am very happy that you asked that question mm -hmm. because you know we live in an era that everybody speaks about stocks right right 2018 2019 mm -hmm. the earlier part of 2020 was ipo 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 and yeah. everybody wanted to get into stocks 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 and i go back to my earlier 
um, argument when I say, if you ask someone, why are you buying this stock? Right. They can't tell you. Yeah. But it's because it's trending right. and everybody's talking about stocks. Or because they think that that's an easy way to make money. Or they think that it's an easier right. way to make money because the persons have this idea that, oh, the stock market, if I invest in the stock market two or three or four years' time, I can become a millionaire. Or a billionaire. Or a billionaire. Right. Right. And you could yeah. if you have the right amount of principal invested. Mm -hmm. But we have to be realistic to say that there, it's impossible for you to invest 10000 mm -hmm. And you invest this 10000 alone, you leave it, mm -hmm. and then in two years' time, you're expecting to see $1 million. That's not realistic. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would encourage a beginner mm -hmm. who knows nothing about investment, but they just know that they want to start investing. Mm -hmm. I would encourage that person to invest in our unit trust, okay. right? Okay. Unit trust is a pooled investment where me, you, all the investors own units right. into this fund, right? Mm -hmm. The fund is professionally managed by a fund manager. So that manager decides what, what um, assets to put into that fund. Okay. So the benefits is that you are, ex you are exposed to diversification. Okay. So versus if you buy a single stock, mm -hmm. right? So you have 10,000 mm -hmm. and you can only buy one stock, mm -hmm. right? You are only exposed to that one stock. Right. And if the value of that stock falls, mm -hmm. then your portfolio value right. will fall. Okay. So, so, and just to be clear, so the reason that you guys, um, or your recommendation in terms of the unit trust is primarily from a risk perspective, right? I because would, the diversification right. it just gives exposure to it, many things, it, right. but it reduces the amount of risk that you have to any exposure for any one any one thing, right? Any one asset okay. class really or right. any one instrument. Right, okay. Right. And then and in the flip side to that though, just so that people can be aware and informed, is that you know, when once you accept the, the, the trade-off of lower risk, you are accepting the trade-off of lower return because generally speaking you know, there is a direct correlation between risk and reward, right? That is correct. There right. is a direct relationship between risk and reward. But on the flip side, mm -hmm. we also have unit trusts that um, are different risk categories. Okay. So you have unit. So even though the general sense of a unit trust is diversification, which in essence would reduce your the, the, the general risk, right. right? You do have unit trusts that are higher risk. Mm -hmm. So we we tell clients that there is two ways to invest in equities here at VM World. You can invest in our unit trust equity fund, mm -hmm. which is a uh, comprises of about maybe thirty or thirty five or forty stocks, right? right? versus just buying a single stock. But right. the equity fund in itself is just as risky mm -hmm. as buying direct equities. Right. So it's really it's really this way or that right. way. Right. But how I would direct a client is if this client say to me that I am not the person to watch the stock market. Right. I right. Right. I don't watch the financial news. Right. I don't know when to sell or yeah. I don't know when to buy right. or I don't know when to hold or I don't know when to say, all right, then let me sell some stock, take some gains and go back into another right. investment. Right. If right. you are, you, you don't know anything about that, right. then clearly you cannot start and right. go into the stock market. Right. Fair enough. So, so if, you, if the person is saying that, you know, the investment decision or the financial decision they want to make is they want to be conscious and they want to begin investing, but they are big because they're busy and they have a lot going on in their life. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, have the time right now, they don't want to take the time right now to do the research to, that, that's required to make individual um, stock picks right. um, for themselves in an informed way that they would rather, your, your suggestion then is a unit trust is best for them. Because, for a beginner. For a beginner. And then gradually, right. you can transition, transition right. into the stock market. Okay. And it's not that you can, it's either or, you can right. have both. Okay, yeah. That's so okay. you can do both, but I'm right. saying as when you're just starting, I would suggest that you go into that managed fund just to get a feel right. of what it's what it's like. Right. And then when you feel like, okay, I am getting my information, because you know we do the, we send out the stock picks on right. a weekly basis. Okay. We also give you a market roundup every single day of what's happening in the market. Okay. So once you send out via email? Via email. Okay. So that goes out every single day religiously right. okay so once you start reading those emails you start getting abreast of what's happening in the market then you can start to develop that confidence to say okay i can now branch off into right. buying 
direct equities. Okay, and so if I am a, let's say I'm, you know, not beginner, but um, you know, not expert, not mid-spec. totally, I have exact mid spec, right? right? And you know, I've done some amount of research, and I say, okay, you know, I have a company in mind, you know, whether it is NCB or whatever. Like I have a specific company that I've done research, and I say, okay, I want to buy that one stock. Mm-hmm. Um, how do I do? Can I do that? You know, with VM Wealth, and then how do I do that? Yes, you you definitely can do that. Mm-hmm. So if you have a stock in mind, as you say, right? Mm-hmm. So we have a, a research team, mm-hmm. very equipped, very educated, right. and lots of resources available, right? So if you say, all right, then I am interested in turning it out your Grace Kennedy, right? right? That's a foundation, stop blue right. chip, right. and you want to invest in GK. Mm-hmm. So we do analysis on mm-hmm. these companies, mm-hmm. right, from time to time. So right. we have those research in our app in our archives interesting so we sh- we can share those okay. analysis with you and as a matter right. of fact those have start going out now as well once those are done right we send out to the client so that you can have those information so rather than me when i'm saying you know again as a misspec investor rather than me saying right, i'm going to download all the quarterly reports and all the annual reports and go through it myself <laughs> right i could just you know get the, the research you reports could just you get guys... the research from okay. us right okay. and, and start there and start there okay. right okay. and it's Great. easy you can just send us an email right. to say um i want to buy Ten thousand worth of Grace Kennedy. Right. It's simple as that. Once you have your email in the museum file, you can just send an email, mm-hmm. transfer the funds online, and then we can do the trade for you. Right. And of course, you know that we also have the J Trader platform right. okay. that you can trade for yourself. Right. And J Trader is a platform that a product that the JC offers right. through brokers. Through the brokers, right? right. That, and it's real time. Right. Exactly. So you can go on, you can execute your trades, you right. can see if it was filled, right. you can see how much it, it was filled for, if right. it is being in a queue or anything. So it's real, real time information. Okay. All right. Well, all right. So we've covered a lot of great information, Peter K, but you know, we have to kind of address the elephant in the room, right? <laughs> Which is sure. which is kind of like the, the reason or the birth of you know finance Twitter JA. Mm-hmm. Um, finance Twitter JA kind of came about because there was this just a collection of, of individuals on Twitter all over the place in industry and outside of industry that started speaking about finance matters. And what we realized is that you know people were just kind of fed up. You know they 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 felt um, um, neglected. Mm-hmm. You know by by the industry generally, right? Like there's a general feeling that. You know, um, most brokerage firms don't care about my little bit of money. You know, mm-hmm. I almost shut up my little bit of money. And that's yeah? a misconception. So I well, just want to point that out. No, I mean, it may be, but mm-hmm. the truth of the matter is that there, there are many, many people, those that I personally have heard from hundreds of people who, feels that way. who have had the experience, mm-hmm. right? That they, they go to an investment house with $10,000. And it's a night and day experience from someone else that goes with, you know, $10 million. $10 million. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So I guess. From that perspective, if I, because we know everybody's human and companies are made of humans, right? So right. they're going to be, and the wealth advisor business is a service oriented business. Definitely. So at some point in the overall interaction, there's going to be some sort of customer service failure. Mm-hmm. So as a, as a VM wealth customer, what recourse do I have um, when that happens? Okay, so that's a very good question, Mark. And we have experienced service failure from time to time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's how we deal with that service failure that really speaks volumes, Mm -hmm. right? So what what we normally do is we give a survey. We do a survey Mm -hmm. on our service experience to all our clients Mm -hmm. on a monthly basis. Okay. So what happened is... During that survey, you'll find that clients will give feedback Mm -hmm. as to what they would have experienced. So once we get those um, feedback from the clients, then the first thing we do is that we we go on the phone, we call those clients, and we want to get an understanding of what is it or where did we go wrong Mm -hmm. in in this service delivery. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have have a thing called SLA, which is a service level agreement, right? And we live by that okay. service level agreement. And an SLA is an agreement between you guys as an advisor right. and who, me, the client? And, and, and the client to right. say that we must deliver a certain level a of service. A minimum level of service. Right. I see. Okay. Right. So what we do is that we ensure that once we get those complaints, and I've always said that complaints is a blessing. Because mm. once you complain, it means that you care. You don't want to leave right, to go right, somewhere right, else, right, right? So we take right. those complaints as a blessing because right. it gives you a chance to correct those right. mistakes and to get it right going forward, yeah. right? So once you have, uh, I would say, a 
failure in the mm -hmm. service, mm -hmm. we encourage you to give us that feedback mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that we can find the root of the problem, mm -hmm. correct it, and ensure that going forward, mm -hmm. you will never experience a service failure but like that. that but again. does it really matter though, Peter? Because I mean, you know, a lot of people, you know, say this, you know, mm -hmm. that have SLAs and whatever, right. but you know, really and truly at the end of the day, does it really make a difference? It does make a difference. How? It does make a difference because guess what? I am affected by How are you your affected negative by? feedback right. and, 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 and I'll break it down for you. Yeah. So on my performance um, metric, which is right. my PMAS, right? right, which is done semi-annually, okay. I am I, I have a hefty grade really? for the NPS. That's uh, what it is, the Net Promoter Score. Okay. So once we and that's from the feedback, the monthly service, right? And that's okay. from the feedback. Interesting. So once you uh, come up as a uh, uh, as a person who gives a negative mm -hmm. um, feedback, right. so that reduces our scores. I am impacted. Heavily. Interesting. Did not know that. Heavily. Okay, so you my guys, negative feedback. You guys hear that? So, so what? What's the key takeaway there? That wait, um, you know, I, I don't know if anybody says, but definitely VMware. If you have an issue with VMware, um, don't just go on Twitter and complain. Right. You can do that too. <laughs> but you know, um, you know, fill out their surveys at the end of the month. And then, and uh, as Peter is saying, it has a direct impact on them. Direct, so, and not just me. Right. Every person in the organization. Right. Interesting. Every, even up to the CEO. Okay. Once that MPS score is below a minimum amount, mm -hmm. then no, no compensation come Christmas. Really? No bonus. Really? No. Wow. Interesting. So it is. It, it has a direct impact okay. on us. But well, that's good. To, I mean, it sucks <laughs> right. for you guys, but, <laughs> but it's so good. that is why it's in our best interest right, to ensure that. For one, we get it right the first time, yeah, right? Yeah. So we don't end up with a service delivery. But as you rightfully said, we are humans right. and we're not going to get it correct every time. Yeah. So service failure will happen, mm -hmm. but it's how we correct it afterwards. Right. Okay. And we ensure that it doesn't move to two months and three months. We try to get that corrected within three days. Once we get that feedback. Within from the three days. Within three days. Okay. All right. Once Good. we get the feedback from the client. I'm happy to hear that. All right. So. All right, so we've covered all that stuff. So what about, are there other, so we've been talking about stocks and whatever, right? Everybody's right. talking about stuff. But are there other... invest long term right. and by investing long term the, the first asset class that will jump out that means equities right. because we know that equities is really a long term investment and why we say that is because we know that there can be volatility right. in that asset class. And volatility so equities mean stock equities mean stock uh, right or shares and then volatility mean that the price moves up, up, and down, and down, right. up and down up and down up and down so once you are able to invest long enough you're able to withstand right. that volatility so even if you so you go in now and like what happened here right, current, right. currently with the pandemic. Right. So right. some persons would have invested in equities in January and February. Nobody expected COVID. Right. And the portfolios went like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you are invested for the long term, you wouldn't be that much daunted because right. you know that I'm, I'm going to be invested for quite some time. Mm -hmm. But if you were not planning to be invested for five years and you wanted to get out at the end of the year, when I say get out, meaning that your goal was one year, right, right. you shouldn't have been in equities in the first place. Right. Right. right? Mm -hmm. So that those those are the questions that must be asked. And, and the primary reason behind those questions is to determine suitability. Mm -hmm. And I've always said, it's not a one size fit all. Mm -hmm. So what is suitable for you mm. is not suitable for me. I am um, suitability from the perspective of you know asset classes or even within the asset class. Even I would I would more say asset classes. Okay. Right? Because 
you may be good for equities right. because you are long term, right. but my goals is short term right. and is one year okay. and is moderate or more so less risky, mm -hmm. more risk averse mm -hmm. than equities cannot be for me. Okay. Right. Well, what about those people that say, okay, well, you know what, I'm just going to, you know, I want to open my own JTrader account, for example, mm -hmm. and um, do my own research and, you know, look for, you know, gains within, you know, three months and six months and stuff. But yeah, what, 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 is that something that you guys kind of help and like guide them on or you just generally discourage it? No, I wouldn't say we generally discourage it. The climate that we're in now, it's hard to say you're going to pick up any gains within three or four months. Right. So what you're trying to do now is to get the opportunities that are available in the market. And by opportunities, I mean stocks that you would have been otherwise at a higher price mm -hmm. is a little bit lower now and you can pick up some of those units. Right. But in terms of to say to flip, that's what right. persons right. call it. Mm -hmm. Buy and sell and get some and mm -hmm. get some gains and mm -hmm. it's not available in the market now. Mm -hmm. Right? Okay. So but to finish your or question harder to find. are harder to find right, right now. Right. So to finish your question, you, you had asked if there are other investments, right? right? And they are. So we outside of stocks and unit trusts, we have bonds, mm -hmm. which are debt instruments. Mm -hmm. Pretty much in layman's term, you have a government or a corporate entity wishing to borrow some funds and they're asking to borrow your money, you lend them right. at a specified interest rate and at for specified time. Right. Okay. And that pays you all the fix, a guaranteed amount, guarantee okay. semi-annually, or you have some notes that pays out quarterly, okay. right? And we do have like cash life investment, which are repurchase agreement, mm -hmm. which have maturity of 30 days, 60 days, and 90 days, 90 days, sorry. And those are for persons who are much, much, much more risk averse risk okay. and don't want to see any fluctuation right. at all in your principal amount. Okay, and in the bonds are more for like, you know, like if I'm a retiree or right, something. Right, right. So bonds are more suitable for investors who are retired or nearing retirement okay. and looking for that income right. on a semi-annual basis. Right, okay. Um, all right, I think this one we kind of covered already, which is kind of investor trade by myself, which we spoke about. Right, J-Trader. J-Trader, right. Um, what about overseas? I mean, this is why I, I, we don't need to dive too deep into it, but, you know, there's been a lot of news lately, you know, but it is Tesla and, You know, right, all of these stocks right, that right. have been doing crazily in the US markets, you know, does um, VMware offer some sort of facilities to allow me to be able to do that myself? Right, so we do offer that type of facility. We have a platform with interactive brokers where you can actually trade by US stocks. Right. So we do have that and it pretty much is similar to the JTrader platform mm -hmm. where you monitor it yourself, you can buy your own stocks, sell your own stocks and you decide what is it that you want to do at any given time right. real life information just as the j trader right. so that is also available at vmworld as well so you're not just limited to the local stock exchange as much as how we encourage that because of course you know the benefits we get from the stock market doing yeah, well absolutely. but it's not only the jamaica stock exchange we do facility trading on the overseas market okay. as well. All right, so um, how do you guys keep track of all client requests and questions that come in? Okay, so we have our email group, right. which is BMWM Client Services. Mm -hmm. We encourage clients to send all their requests through mm -hmm. that channel. Mm -hmm. And of course, we would have expanded the sales team, so we have sales mm -hmm. support. So as a client, and I am your advisor, it don't necessarily mean that you have to send a request to me personally. You right. can always copy me an email, but we have designated person who handles those requests, right? Okay. So we have our sales support guys who right. support the advisors and the senior advisors like myself. So we have a wealth, uh, a wealth officer as well who also supports the wealth advisor. So we have many different channels where you can send in your requests. And that is also monitored by that same SLA. SLA I was going to ask. Right. Okay, all right. So, so we, everything falls on Everything SLA. falls okay. under the SLA okay. to ensure that the transactions are being done on time. Right, okay. Right. Okay. And to the satisfaction of the client. And to the satisfaction of the client. Okay, all right. Um, I guess I, you know, this question is, how long does it take to make good money from investments or to achieve my financial goals? I know that's a kind of a, you know, a yes. generic and a general yes. a tough question. Yes, it's, 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 I would say, 
it's relative right right and it all comes back down to what is your timeline yeah. and what are your goals and what are you trying to achieve um I've, and this is real life i've known person i've onboarded clients who have made two million right. in three months right. right and that would have exceeded that client's expectation mm -hmm. but it all depends also on how the market is performing mm -hmm. right now you know that we are going through this pandemic things are a little bit at a, a standstill and we're just trying to ride it out to see but in general i would say it all depends on your timeline right. so if you have a timeline of one year or a timeline of two years what we do is find asset classes that can get you to that goal fast enough right so that is the underlying factor okay all right so it all comes down to i guess just you know who you are as an individual as an investor and right. what your goals and are. what your goals are and right. most importantly your timeline right and your risk appetite because we don't want to put you into something that is you're not suitable for right just to get a quick return because the flip can happen mm -hmm. right so things can be going good right and then here comes COVID exactly, exactly. and things start going south yeah and mm -hmm. then your portfolio start going down mm -hmm. and then you didn't plan for that mm -hmm. so it all comes down to suitability that is the most important aspect right. of investment okay and then so speaking of COVID, COVID so what what advice would you give during this um, current economic climate when the uh, market is underperforming well for new clients mm -hmm. i would say our clients who have not done any investment at all mm -hmm. No, it's an opportune time mm -hmm. to get in. As I said before, stock prices are down now. Mm -hmm. You want to buy in at these low prices, hold, mm -hmm. because we must recover one day, mm -hmm. right? So you want to get in now when the prices are low and take, take, take the opportunity as mm -hmm. they present themselves. And as for existing- No, do, no, do we buy anything? No, or? we don't buy anything. Okay. So we'll come back down to our list of recommended stocks right so the stocks. research so the research is okay. where this part will come in so you don't right. just want to buy because this stock was a hundred dollars right. because of covid and it's not right. fifty dollars they say oh let me run and go with right. no, you still have to do the research because see. every company is affected every, by, 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 by their prices differently, differently. so for right. example in tourism you know you look at like a dolphin pool, for right. example right that just reported earnings recently right. and they're for the first time in their history they report zero revenue, zero, which is zero revenues. insane. Right. But right. I mean, it makes sense. But yeah. I mean, you, you look at they the stock and say, John, no, they're no, let me dive they in, but dive in without more. doing research. Without, right. So we don't encourage that. So we, right. what we want to do is ensure that you are making informed exactly. decisions. Mm -hmm. And you can only make informed decisions when you have adequate information. Right. right? And I will go back to our information that is sent out on a daily basis mm -hmm. so we give you a roundup of what's happening in the market we tell you which stocks traded um down or up or which one only firm and so forth so you, we ensure that you have adequate information right. to make informed decisions right okay right all right well thank you very much peter J. um yes, you're welcome those were i guess the main things that i had on my plate that i wanted to you know discuss with you i think sure. that you know that main segment you know we're kind of covered um i believe that we have a giveaway that we would like to discuss with you guys so um the rules were well initially we had said that we were going to um you know randomly you know ask a question and so on but now we have um based on people that have registered we're going to randomly choose a winner right so um drum roll please Okay, oh, okay, sorry. You, you guys need to go ahead and register. You register right now, and then we will, um, you know, choose to give away the, the winner a little later. All right, so now what we're going to go into is a question and answer. And I believe that we have some um, questions from the audience. Can we see some of those shortly? But, all right, while we get that kind of, um, squared away um so so peter yeah generally speaking i mean it, it has been a, a a very very tough time you know as an investor i mean my portfolio has been significantly impacted i mean i guess, I guess as yes, everybody yes. has right mine as well yeah yes. so it's it's been um it's been quite 
um, nerve wracking as yes. it were. So I can't imagine what it would be like if you know if you you, know, you had like a one month goal or a two month or a three month goal and then everything just you know, goes completely, exactly goes mm-hmm. sideways and so um, you know given you know what is happening, are there any kind of things that we can think about how to navigate this um, you know kind of environment you know better right now? Well, I would say that um, for one, we just have to kind of stay the course, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's so don't panic and no, sell everything. Right. So, so what we're saying is no panic selling, right. no panic selling, right? Because you know, as I always say to my clients, when you panic sell, yeah. that's another investor picking up that opportunity. Yeah. That's uh, your that's loss, that's right? Point. So we say no panic selling. We have to stay the course. And it might sound cliche, but you want to try and pick up more securities or investment at this time when the prices are low. Mm-hmm. So that you're, you know, basically balancing out right. the portfolio. Right. So you want to use a ladder approach where, you know, you even though we don't know if the market has bottomed out, right. prices may still get lower, mm-hmm. but you want to pick up the units as the prices go. So you, you, may, you don't have to... Say, all right, if you have a hundred thousand, you don't have to necessarily buy a hundred thousand worth of this stock right at this moment. Right. If you can spend a twenty thousand and you mm-hmm. watch the market if it goes on a little bit further, mm-hmm. you get some more and then you get some more. So you find that that balances out the portfolio right. during this time. Right, okay. Right. You're trying to spread out what your total average cost average is. Average out. That's what you're basically trying right. to do, the average out. So right. No point selling. Right. We actually went through a series of presentations during the heights of, of, of COVID mm-hmm. to say that, you know, we know, I mean, nobody wants to see their portfolio going down. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter how aggressive an investor you say you are, yeah. nobody likes to lose. Yeah. Right? So we went through a series of presentations around March, April, that was the heights of COVID. And we're just encouraging the clients to just stay the course. You don't want to panic sell. And even if you have to sell, you want to be strategic mm-hmm. in your selling. You want to look at your portfolio. You want to see, all right, then would I have made some gains on these stocks? Mm-hmm. Can I sell these stocks now, get some additional gains, right. and go back into another stock, mm-hmm. right? So you're, 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 you're reinvesting right. and right. balancing out your portfolio, right? right? right. So. That's what we're basically encouraging clients to do at this time. Mm-hmm. No panic selling. Right. And if you do sell, we be strategic. Right. And just make sure that you, you're informed. Like make sure you know what no, it is. You what know? Is so that, right. for example, there are certain things like for example, some of the banks, for example, you know, the, the pandemic, you know, um, has come along and so the banks are gonna be hit because they're you know, they're offering moratoriums right. and loans right. and, right. and right. stuff. Right. So you know, the, the average, the non-performing exactly, the non-performing loans are right. going to increase, you increase, know, so right. like, the debt is going to start going bad. And so people may, um, you know, uh, panic and want to get rid of the stuff. Get rid of this, right. But, you know, for so, for certain financial institutions that are, you know, well diversified that can weather the storm, you may want to, um, you know, as you said, if you believe you've done your research or whatever, and you know, you have confidence that, okay, this particular um, bank or financial institution can weather the storm, weather the storm right. then as other people, you know, um, sell and it drives the price down, drives you, the can price down then you can pick up some, exactly. get some opportunities yeah. there. Okay. All right. So we have, um, we have some questions. I'm going to start off here from Corey Hyde. Mm-hmm. Um, and Corey asks, is it true that if you are not thinking of owning a stock for 10 years, don't even think about owning it for 10 minutes. That's a famous um, kind of investment quote. That's like, incorrect. You, you think so? I would say. Okay. So I, what are your thoughts about that? I don't think that you are, and I would like to call it grave stocks. I, it don't mean that you have to, if you're not buying a stock to own it for 10 years, mm-hmm. it's a stock that you shouldn't buy. Okay. Because what we encourage clients to do is that we look at the portfolio. So we do regular portfolio reviews. It don't necessarily mean that you have to hold a stock for 10 years because what if that stock price goes the other way? You know what would have happened? You would have, you didn't pick up any gains. Right. And we've seen that happen a lot of times. So mm-hmm. you bought the stock at $2, right? The stock price increased, the company is doing well, and it went to $10. Mm-hmm. A pandemic comes like COVID and the stock price went to $4. Mm-hmm. 
you could have get some gains because you would have what double triple right. your profit mm -hmm. so it's not i wouldn't say that you have to if you're not planning to hold the stock for 10 years that you can mm -hmm. we encourage clients to say let us look at the portfolio you right. can and another strategy that we use you can always keep your principal mm -hmm. invested in that stock okay. take your gains mm -hmm. you could even buy some more of that same stock mm -hmm. if the price falls or you could buy another stock right okay so it doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't plan to hold the stock for 10 years right. it's not worth having yeah no. I, I think i think the kind of like the essence of what um corey or what that quote is kind of getting at is you know you know if you're not if you're not sure about yeah mm -hmm. like if you don't understand the company then mm -hmm. right like and you don't think that the company will be around for 10, 10 years, years then maybe you shouldn't bother investing at all yeah like, in other words like if you if you think that it is purely speculative and um, you know, you generally you have no clue, no clue. about mm -hmm. you know how this company is gonna perform because you don't understand it. Right. You know, I is that a good fit for your portfolio. Right. You know and I can understand that perspective. Right. But I will still go back to say that you could leave your principal invested in that stock. Okay. Sell some, mm -hmm. take your gains, mm -hmm. and you can buy another stock. Okay. So it doesn't mean that you're going to um sell it in its entirety mm -hmm. or and I've, and, and I've seen this happen many times mm -hmm. when you look at your portfolio most time it is at a point in time right right, right. you can right. say all right then no I say all right then I think that mail mm -hmm. is going to do very well mm -hmm. in the next five or so years right two or three years later things may change right, right? right. and it doesn't right. mean that you have to remain right that way right so it's i get the i get the, the understanding i right. get what it, what what it's trying to say but right. i'm just saying that is you can always look at it as another way so right we can right. Look so in other words you need to constantly be reevaluating your portfolio right. because things may change things change right. your goals change exactly right okay, fair enough. things fair change enough. so yeah. it's, it's all about perspective and how you can look at it so okay. it's not static and it's, right. it doesn't mean that it's not tunnel vision it right. doesn't mean that oh once you're not holding it for 10 years then it's a no right right okay. so we have to remain flexible right that's it that's most important okay all right so really quickly um how can i buy shares in apple this is from natasha go again i hope i'll pronounce it and I, I apologize if i butcher the name well that would be through our platform that you mentioned right so we if if you're not a client of mm -hmm. PM1, then you can open an account and sign up. Mm -hmm. And if you are a client, then you could register for the international equity trade, and okay. then you will be able to access okay. that platform to buy Apple stocks. Okay. All right, cool. Well, thank you very much, Peter Gay. We are going to um, move over now to our next presentation, which is from the wonderful Deborah Taylor from Select Brands. Now, when, when I I was reading Deborah's resume. You know, the resume turn up. You know, like she, she has thirty years of wine and spirits experience. Um, she was a partner in I didn't know this in Bin Twenty Six Wine Bar in Devon House. So that that's that's pretty cool. Um, and she also she's a a, a W Set educator, which is a wine and spirits education trust educator. She's called Wine Lady Deborah. So <laughs> Deborah, take it away. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Good. I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, well, you stole my introduction. I'm Deborah Taylor, also known as my Lady Deborah. <laughs> and it is my delight to share with you a little bit of what I know about wine. So I, today's session is an introduction to wines, Wine 101. And, you know, we're going to talk about different aspects of wine. So I love this subject. I eat it, sleep it, drink it, travel it, read it, learn about it. And so um, just as how you know, passionate Peter Gay was about what she was talking about, I'm there. So what is this wonderful thing called wine? Very, very simply, wine is fermented grape juice. And fermentation is a very natural process that takes place with the presence of yeast, and that yeast goes through and it eats up the sugars and it converts that sugar to alcohol and CO2. And voila, we have this beautiful drink called wine that we know and love. Are you going to bring up my um, visuals? Are you hearing me? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, they're bringing it up now, uh, Deborah, one second. No problem. So the winemaking process is quite involved and, you know, it, it, it starts with having good quality grape um, seedlings to, to, you know, grow great grapes. And the focus in the, in the vineyard is on quality grapes versus quantity grapes. So a, a vineyard owner or winemaker will want to know, would prefer to know that they have a small bunch of 10 grapes that are, you know, um, that are rich and, and, and intense versus a bunch of 100 grapes uh, because the focus is on quality, not quantity. So it's very important to start with good rootstock and there's, I mean, the vineyard management process is quite involved and we won't go into that too much, but, uh, but just know that there is a great level of attention paid to, de um, uh, paid to details in terms of your rootstock, the kind of soil, the amount of water, and some areas don't allow irrigation at all. Uh, and, you know, um, canopy management, so the amount of exposure to sun, whether these vines are grown on slopes or in valleys or, you know, on, on hilltops, etc. cetera. So um, they, 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 we have our grapes, they come, they, we start, um, they, they start, but the vines start budding somewhere in about February, March, and they go through a process where they start out green and they then mature through the summer and harvest somewhere around September into October. So then we harvest our grapes and I'm hoping that the visual um, for how wine is made um, can come up so you can see how wine is made uh, just to give you an idea. And um, we, we harvest our grapes and then we take them into the winery and we crush them. And we crush them because we want to open the skins and allow the flesh to be exposed so that the juices um, can flow and that the sugars can do what they, uh, uh, the yeast can do what it needs to do and eat up the sugars. Uh, we, if we're making white wines, then we will take the skins away. But if we're making red wines, we'll leave the skins in contact with the flesh and the liquid so that the color can be extracted. And then um, we, we have our fermentation process. Um, and then we determine whether we're going to put these wines into oak barrels or whether they'll stay in their stainless steel tanks for a period of time or whether they go straight to bottle. So all the wine in all the world will fall into one of three categories. Our first category is still wines. And these wines tend to be 8 to 15% um, percent alcohol by volume. And in many instances, you'll see the name of a grape on the bottle. So you may see Pinot Grigio, Chardonnay, Merlot, Malbec, Moscato, Shiraz, etc. But in some cases, you won't see the name of the grape and you'll see an area on the bottle. So for instance, you'll see Chianti or Bordeaux or Burgundy or indeed Champagne. And um, when you see that, it, they assume you know what grapes are grown in that region. Um, so, it, you, it, you know, as you gradually get to know your grapes, then you'll know what that means. Then we have our sparkling wines, and our sparkling wines have bubbles of carbon dioxide trapped in the bottles. And the most popular sparkling wine that we all know and love is Champagne. And most of us would have heard it said that all champagne is sparkling wine, but not all sparkling wine is champagne. And that statement is very true because for a champagne, for a sparkling wine to be called champagne, it has to come from the champagne region in France. Uh, and, and if it comes from anywhere else, no matter what method they use to make it, it cannot be called champagne. So the Italians have a beautiful sparkling wine that is called Prosecco. And in some instances, they use a similar method to champagne, but and they cannot fetch the price and they cannot call it champagne. Uh, another popular style of sparkling wine out of Spain is Cava. And then we have our fortified wines. And fortified wines have higher alcohol content. They tend to be 15 to 22 percent alcohol by volume. And alcohol by volume means that in a bottle, let's say one liter, 
if I say that the ABV, alcohol by volume, is 22%, then it means 22% of the liquid in that bottle is alcohol. All right, and so um, the popular styles of fortified wines that we know of are port, which comes from Portugal, and sherry, which comes from Spain. So wines will fall into one of three color categories. So stylistically, there are three categories and they are still, sparkling and fortified. And then in terms of color, there are three categories. So we have our white wines, usually made from white grapes, but you can make a white wine from black grapes by taking the skins away. Because in, when we're making white wines, we are, we're using the juice only. Then we have our rosé wines or blush wines, which have that delightful pinky salmony color. And many of us see that color and we think the rosé is sweet. And in some cases, if it's a Moscato rosé, then definitely it is sweet. But generally speaking, rosés tend to be dry. White Zinfandel, which is a, also a blush wine, is medium sweet. And to get that beautiful pinky color, we leave the skins in contact with the juice for a short period of time, and then we take the skins away, and voila, we have our blush wine. And then we have our big, bold, juicy, fruity, yum, yum, yum red wines that are made with black grapes only because we have to leave the, the skins in contact with the flesh and the liquid for the color to be extracted from the skin. So just think about us making our sorrel and how we leave the um, petals to, to you know soak in the water overnight and then, well, in fact, it, it draws pretty quickly actually, uh, but then you have that beautiful, deep, rich red drink that we love. Uh, so it's a similar thing with our wines. We leave the, with our red wine, sorry, we leave our skins in contact with the juice and the flesh for a period of time and then we take away the skins and everything else and we have our red wines. An important question that I get asked all the time is, what is, is it okay to, to put my red wine in the fridge? And emphatically, resoundingly, I say, absolutely. And then someone will say, but I, I've heard that, you know, you must serve red wine at room temperature. Yes, that is so. But they were referring to European temp room temperature, which on even a warm day comes down to somewhere around 65, uh, 60, 65, which for us means we would need to put on a sweater. So uh, in, in, in the coolest of rooms, in the average room in Jamaica, it's upwards of 75 without an air conditioning on, I mean. And so it is highly recommended that you do keep your red wines in the fridge. Uh, there are wine fridges, some of them dual temperature controlled so that you can have a section for your whites and a section for your reds. But you know, your home fridge works just as well. And what you can do is take your red wines out about 10 to 15 minutes before you're ready to serve it. And it will come down to a nice temperature. And you can judge, you can gauge that by just resting the back of your hand on the glass and it should be cool to the touch. Uh, so that ideal temperature for your reds would be somewhere around yeah, 65 degrees. Yeah. Um, and then for your whites, you wanna serve them cold because um, the humidity here means that you, when you pour it, it warms up very quickly in the glass. I always ask and recommend that when you're dining out and you're being served your wine, just ask them to pour a little as I have in this glass and keep replenishing your wine as you go through um, your evening or your meal. Because if you pour too much, if you pour it up to here, then by the time it gets to here, it's warmed up in a way that doesn't make the wine as enjoyable as it could or should be. And in, in some instances, we are put off our wine because we are having it at temperatures that are too warm. So we are not being, we're not able to enjoy uh, the, the wine at the temperature that it should be served at. And you know, when the wine is too warm, you kind of get this alcohol note to it and the aromas don't come forth as they should. Um, alternatively, when the wine is too cold, it's almost 
frozen. So, you know, you really, the right temperature is important. And to maintain the right, temp right temperature is not as easy for us because of the levels of humidity. So it's best to just pour a little at a time. I tend to um, keep my red wine, well, red wines, once you, when you take them out of the, the atmosphere that is cold and you have it on your table, it'll maintain a cool temperature, but your whites tend to get quite warm. So it's important to have a bucket with ice that you can keep your the rest of the bottle in so that you can replenish as you go along. So here's the fun part. And, um, the, and this is the, 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 the um, a 5S system that we encourage everyone to do so that they can enjoy their wine and to know why they're doing what they're doing and the effect that it will have on the wine. So most of us will get a glass of wine and as soon as we get it, the first thing we do is we take a sip. Uh, that is okay, but when you do what I'm about to show you to do, I want you to give me your comments because you're going to get my contact details after. So I want you to email me, WhatsApp me, whatever, and let me know. Hit me up on um, Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and tell me your thoughts and, and tell me how this has changed for you, your enjoyment of wine. Because uh, wine is a very sensory experience and we do these, we, we go through these steps so that we can have the best experience with our wine. So the five S steps that we take are firstly to see. So once our wine is in glass, we usually hold it up to the light or we hold it um, away from us over the white tablecloth or over a piece of white paper. And basically we're looking to see that the wine is sound. So if it's a white wine, it should have some a, a, a yellow look and it should, the wine should always look alive. It should be glistening, you know, it should be shimmery. Uh, when you pour a glass of wine and the, the wine, the color is flat, and uh, dull and looking like you know this envelope color flat or overly yellow even going to orange it doesn't that does not necessarily mean that the wine is not good it could mean that you're drinking an older wine and at that point you would refer to your bottle because if it says it's a 1967 chardonnay maybe not if it's a 1985 Chardonnay, then you would know that that's why it's that color. Now, you may ask, could that possibly be good? Yes, if it is a, a, a Chardonnay that has been designed to be aged for 20 years, particularly coming out of um, some of the better regions in France, then yes, it, it would still be drinkable. And I've had the pleasure of having a Bordeaux, um, a wine, a Chardonnay from France that had been aged uh, for around 20 odd years. This was a few years ago. And it was very interesting to taste, to know what a Chardonnay, a, a young, fresh, young, fresh and green Chardonnay tastes like um, versus what a, an older, much more developed Chardonnay tastes like. So back to color. I, told you, I, can, I tell you, I can talk about this all day. Anyway, so color, so we see, so we're looking for the integrity of the wine. This is a Pinot Grigio, so it's going to be very, very thin. You're going to be able to read through it if you hold it over a paper with writing uh, because it is of, of, you know, very light intensity. So, um, so we are looking at the color. Then the next thing we do is that we give the wine a swirl. And when we swirl our wine, we're allowing air to pass over the wine so that the aromas will be able to come forth. So we give it a good swirl. And our next step is to sniff. Mm. Mm. Mm, mm, mm. And for me, wine is exciting and stimulating. And when I smell a wine that has beautiful aromas, I start salivating. And that's why we need to do this critical step. Most wine officials, um, your official tasters or masters of wine will tell you 
that they don't need to actually put the wine in their mouth to be able to tell you if the wine is good or bad or sound or they can tell all they need to know about a wine just by nosing. And it's, it's important because if you think about it, if, you, if you're having a cold or a sinus issue, your taste buds are off. So what smelling does is it sends, your nose sends a message to your brain to tell your mouth what to taste. Very important, critical step in our enjoyment of wine. So you'll ask, so when I go to a restaurant and I order a glass of wine, and they send out a glass of wine, what do I do? Because usually if it's a glass of wine, they'll fill it up to here because they don't usually use these big glasses. So the five ounces is gonna come up to, you know, um, uh, close to the top. So you're, you're not able to swerve. So I usually ask for an, another glass. Actually, what I usually do is I buy a bottle, but that's me. We won't talk about that. And I take the rest with me, okay? Right, but um, so that's, that's an option. But you really do want to be able to have enough wine, just enough wine in glass so that you're able to swirl and be able to enjoy your wine, okay? So the first step we said was to see. Our second step is to swirl. Our third step after swirling is to sniff. And then our fourth step is to swallow. I mean, sip, you see? I'm so excited, I can't wait to taste. What I did was while I had the wine in my mouth, I was pulling in a little bit more air so that it opened up some more and really sent those aromas into the nasal passage, which immediately had my mouth watering. And my mouth watered when I tasted this wine because of the crisp acidity in it. So I am drinking a glass of Pierre Deliso, Pinot Grigio, 2019. Yes, my one was in the fridge and I poured from the bottle. So this is um, Pierre Deliso, Pinot Grigio. It's from Italy. And this wine is a light, it's a dry wine, which means it's not sweet. Um, and it's um, a light body. And that means that um, it's, a, it's a very light wine. And wines can be light medium and full or heavy so there's a spectrum and to, to understand it just kind of think of milk skimmed milk is quite light and thin so that's your light bodied milk your half and half would be your medium bodied milk and then we have full cream yum yum creamy concentrated full and heavy so wines can be light bodied medium bodied and full or heavy bodied okay so this wine is dry it's light bodied. On the nose, when I smelled it, I got lemon, lime, citrusy notes, and hints of apple and something flowery. And on the palate, when I tasted it, I definitely got green apples and lemon, lime notes. The alcohol content is low. A Pinot Grigio alcohol content tends to be low. Um, light bodied wines tend to have lower alcohol content, um, body, uh, lower alcohol content. And remember, we said for these still wines, the alcohol content range is 8 to 15 percent. And this one is, where is it? On the label, it is 12 percent. All right. So 12 percent. And then, uh, yeah, so that's my assessment of this in a ratio. At this point, I just want to ask if there are any questions before I go into the other section of the presentation. All right, so let me continue, and I guess we'll take all questions at the end. All right, so wine and food. Mm -mm -mm. Oh, I got a question. Do they grow grapes in Jamaica? Short answer, yes. And uh, the short answer is yes. We, we do grow grapes in Jamaica, but we don't grow wine making grapes in Jamaica. And the reason for that is that we are too close to the equator and it's way too hot for way too long. And because gra grapes like 
a long, slow ripening phase, which helps to develop the um, what we call the phenolics and to develop the grape and the concentration of flavors and the complexity of flavors that we need to be able to um, to be able to go through the process of winemaking to make good wine. So, uh, so wine, grape growing, wine making countries fall 30 to 50 degrees north of the equator. Uh, so that's where you'd find, part, you know, Canada, USA, Europe, parts of China, parts of India that are growing uh, grapes. And 30 to 50 degrees south of the equator, where we find South America, mainly Chile and Argentina, although, you know, there are other countries, Brazil, Mexico, etc., that do make wines. Uh, we also find South Africa and Australia, New Zealand. So wine and food, the fun stuff. How do I know what to eat, to drink with what I'm eating? So first of all, there are no rules. There are guidelines. You are entitled to have drink whatever you want to drink with whatever you're eating. Wine is supposed to be fun, right? Let's not, don't get too caught up about it. Uh, you know, pairing or, or matching, it can be fun and can make a meal, you know, a nice meal, fantastic. And, you know, when you get a, a, a meal paired with a wine, it can take you to gastronomy heaven. Okay. And we, we love going there. But generally speaking, in our everyday life, when we're just, you know, enjoying a glass of wine and eating something, just have fun with it. If you taste a wine and you don't like it, don't sweat it. No matter how much everyone else is raving about it, don't feel uncomfortable or unhappy. It's, it's not to your liking. I promise you, if you don't like wine or that wine is not to your liking, I can find you a wine that you will like. Challenge me. All right, so, so one of the rules is there are no rules. Drink what you want with whatever you're eating. However, there are guidelines, and these guidelines have stood the test of time, that white wines and white meats work really well together, and red wines and red meats work really well together. Try, tested, and actually proven. Um, that is because white meats are lighter, and white wines are lighter. Red meats are heavier, and red wines are heavier. So you can see that there is that synergy there and that makes a lot of sense. However, one of the things one must be careful of is, is to ensure that um, you, uh, you take into account the sauces, the spices that are on the meat before, um, when you're thinking about what wine to have. Because if you're, if I, if you're eating curry shrimp, curry chicken or curry goat, the first thing you're gonna taste is curry and you know curry is quite a strong flavor and for for us curry tends to be spicy so you have the intensity of curry and you have the intensity of pepper then you have the meat so you have to take all of that into consideration when deciding what wine you're going to have all right so keep that in mind uh if your wine has high high acid you may want to have something with a good fat content because that will help to tone down the acidity and the acidity will help to cut through the fat. Or you could have something that has good acidity with your high acid food. So high, high acid food would be something like a bolognese, um, you know, a stew kind of um, with tomatoes because um, tomatoes do have quite high acid. And so you want to take that into account when you're, when you're deciding what wine you want to have. So if you're having a piece of grilled fish, just a simple um, salt, pepper, maybe a little garlic. I love garlic. Uh, a Pinot Grigio, for instance, Fior de Lisa Pinot Grigio is a good match uh, because it has nice crisp acidity and it will help to, um, to, to balance the, 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 the salt and the pepper and the um, garlic, okay? And you know, grilled fish is kind of simple. So it's, it's easy. If you're having a fried fish, however, you may want to have, because of the, the, the fattiness of fried food, you may want to have a Sauvignon Blanc, which it tends to be a medium bodied wine with higher, medium to high acidity to cut through that level of fat. And if you're having a steamed fish, mm, 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 steamed fish with the okra and the pumpkin and thing, 
then you may want to have a glass of Chardonnay because Chardonnay is your full medium to full bodied white wine that tends to have this vanilla buttery characteristic that will complement the buttery characteristics of our steamed fish. And if you wanted to have a glass of red with your steamed fish, as I am wont to do most times because I love red wines, uh, then a glass of Pinot Noir would work beautifully. So Pinot Noir is on the light side of red wines. So it's one of the lightest styles of red wines. And when we talk about the styles of these wines, although we'll say most Pinot, is, Pinot Noir is light bodied and most Pinot Grigio is light bodied, that's not to say that you won't find a medium bodied Pinot Grigio or a medium bodied or even a full bodied Pinot Noir because there are factors, um, you know, oak aging and, and length of time aging that can help the wine to develop in complexity and body in bottle or in barrel, okay? But generally speaking, our grapes will fall into a category and most wines of that style will follow. I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, ask me the question and I'll say it another way. Chicken, a staple. Uh, you know, chicken is white meat. So when we talk about fish, by the way, um, that includes shrimp and lobster, great with Chardonnays uh, and, uh, and Sauvignon Blancs, uh, because those tend to be heavier styles of, um, of, of white meats. Um, chicken, heavy style, heavier still than fish and lobster and shrimp. And, um, and, and chicken, some parts of chicken have what they call dark meat, which means, you know, it's, it's more t intense and, and can compete with, I guess, pork. And those, we tend to suggest uh, medium to full-bodied wine. So it would be your uh, Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay, depending on the style of chicken. So if it's like a lemon chicken, uh, I would go with uh, Sauvignon Blanc. But for sweet and sour chicken, for instance, I would go in, um, in the Chardonnay realm. Uh, or if you wanted a glass of red, again, I'd, I'd go with uh, Pinot Noir. Or, you know, a lighter style Merlot uh, could be interesting. <laughs> um, pork or veal, heavier styles of white into dark meat. And so definitely Chardonnay, Riesling. Uh, Riesling is... Uh, off dry style of white wine and sorry not not it, it, it ranges from dry actually through to sweet but most tend to be off dry through to sweet and uh reasoning is a very nice wine to have with a meal and pairs particularly well with asian food and with sushi but pork or veal that it can go well with that too and then again i would have a pinot or merlot if i wanted a pinot noir or merlot if i wanted a red wine uh for lamb yum 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 flavorful meat and lamb you know we don't need to to over season our lamb you just need a little salt pepper garlic onion a scallion and definitely some rosemary and you want to sit down with your lamb and a glass of Shiraz or Malbec or Zinfandel uh, because, you know, um, lamb is such a bold flavor. It needs a big, bold wine to stand up to it. Also, our steak, beef steak, uh, you know, Malbec, Cabernet Sauvignon, Shiraz, heavier styles of Merlot are all wonderful wines to experiment with when you're having your steaks. And if you want it, by the way, as I said, have fun with it. I've been trying out Rieslings and Chardonnays with my steak and with my lamb and having fun. Uh, just ensure that you're having heavier styles of those wines, of, your, of the white wines, so that you can have a bit of balance because, you know, um, red meats are a bit heavier, so you want to ensure that your wine has a bit of body on it so that it can manage because you don't want the wine to overpower the food or the food to overpower the wine what we're always trying to have is balance and we can use one to complement the other now um one varietal that we haven't really spoken about is our moscato 
uh, because a lot of us do enjoy a glass of Moscato, well, or two of Moscato. Um, and there's no shame in liking sweet wines, no shame in the game at all. And, and what you find is that it pairs really well with most things. If, you, if it's a style of wine that you like, it's going to be agreeable with most things that you're eating because the sweet um, is, is enough to just balance everything else that's going on. And sweet works particularly well with pepper because it, it helps to just soothe your palate. The other very food friendly drink is sparkling wine. So or Prosecco's, even champagne, yum, yum. I love a meal that's accompanied by champagne from start to finish. Uh, but more realistically, I'm likely to have Prosecco with my meal from start to finish because that's more affordable. And, uh, but sparkling wines, because of the bubbles and the crisp acidity, they act as like a palate cleanser. And so they give balance also to, you know, pretty much anything you're eating. So they're great as an aperitif at the start of a meal, you know, as in for cocktails and they're great throughout the meal. And it's also nice to kind of finish up with a, a glass of uh, a bubbly. So on to desserts, because yes, we do have wine with our desserts. Um, as I said, I will have wine with everything because I love me some wine. So uh, we have wine with, we have um, with our desserts, we have Moscato, you know, uh, we can have uh, Riesling, medium to sweet Riesling. We can have what we call ice wine, which is made um, in Canada and in Germany. And it's a very sweet, but richly sweet uh, dessert wine that pairs very well with things like, um, you know, sugar and spice cake, one of my favorites, or a lychee cake or a strawberry cake or cheesecake, you know, um, and, and any fruity kind of dessert. There's also a, a wine, a style of wine called Sauternes, which is from France, a dessert wine, and it's beautiful also uh, with our desserts. And uh, for chocolate, I mean, a lot of us like chocolate stuff. Uh, we like to have either a piece of hard chocolate or, you know, chocolate cake. I have a weakness for chocolate. And I tend to have my Cabernet Sauvignon, because I tend to like a glass of Cabernet in the evenings. And I'll have that with a piece a piece of hard chocolate, beautiful pairing. But the, the dessert wine that we can have with, um, with our chocolate dessert is port. Port is a great way to end a meal. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful end. It works well with cheeses and it works well with our chocolate desserts. And ladies and gentlemen, as I told you, I can go on and on and on about this subject, but I just wanted to give you a sampler, a taste, and uh, give you a window into my world. So that brings me to the end of my presentation, and the floor is now open for you to ask me any questions you may have. And I'll put my contact details up, so if you have any questions, please follow Select Brands JA, and follow me, Wine Lady Deborah, on the social media uh, platforms there. And now let me take your questions. Thank you very much, Deborah. Wine Lady, really, Wine Lady, I learned so much. I mean, the champagne, I didn't, I didn't realize that, you know, it, it's only wines that were grown in champagne in France that we call champagne. You yes. know, I also, I didn't know about port in terms of Portugal, so that was really cool. You know, so there are a lot of, I mean, very, very great presentation, um, Deborah. Thank so thank you. you very much. Um, yeah, so we have a number of questions that I want to just kind of dive into really quickly. All right, so Kevston Johnson asks, are there any wine tasting events in Jamaica? Yes. Follow me, follow Select Brands, follow Uncorked Jamaica, and you will know more about them. And contact me if you would like me to arrange one with you. Okay, great, great. Um, all right, and then Fitzroy Smith asks, does the import time affect the wine taste? Yes, any import time? Uh, good, very good question. Uh, the short answer is not anymore. Uh, the, we are using, uh, they're not quite refrigerated, but they're insulated containers that help to keep the wines cool 
And one of the things that we ensure is that as soon as it gets to port, it's in our warehouse pretty quickly. And, and that arrangement um, is very important because uh, wines, if they sit in the heat, they start to cook. Uh, by the way, if any of you have wines at home that, are, that have a cork, you need to keep them on their side so that the liquid is in contact with the cork. And you need to keep it away from heat, light, and movement. So if it's in the kitchen, side of the oven, or the fridge, move it because that heat is cooking it. Or if the sun rays are coming in on it, or if there's a direct light um, that is shining on the bottle, beg you move it because you're cooking the wine. And when you're ready for it, it will not be at its best. Oh, interesting. So that, that is that why they I guess, the preferred. You know, when you see those movies and you see the wine cellars and whatever, is that why? Because dark. because it's dark and, mm -hmm. and I guess cool. It's very cool and it's dark and it's stable. Okay. Yeah, because okay, cool. movement, movement. When you move the bottle, you agitate the swirling. Ah, right. You, you, you're imitating. You're you're agitating the wine, so you're imitating swirling. Sorry. And so it wakes up the wine. And while when the wine is in bottle, you want it to rest. Okay. So, all right. Um, next question. All right. So Novid McGrown asks, the pronunciation alone is intimidating to fall in love with wine. I no, 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 that. no, no, no. Let's okay, be let's know this. No, 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 no. It's a lot simpler than you think. But here's what. Google is everybody's friend. And Google has a pronunciation tool that you just type in the word and it'll tell you how to say it. Or Alexa or whoever we all talk to, they can help. If you have a problem, just send me the word and I will talk to you and tell you how to pronounce it. No problem. We have a, a, a Pinot Grigio. I got that right, right? Yes, you did. But what's the brand name? Uh, well, this one is... Okay, so the one that we're giving away is Rufino. That's right, but what's that one in your head? This one, boy, never, <laughs> this, one, this one is Fior Daliso. There you go. You see, it looks, uh, so we get intimidated by just looking at the word because there are so many letters. But yeah. if you just break it down, you know, it's really simple. And here's, here's the thing, guys. We need to just get past this thing. If you don't know, you don't know. So just make an attempt. And if, you're, if it's incorrect, then... I'll just correct you. There's no shame in that game. So please just have fun with the wines. Okay, that's good. And I, that's a similar kind of approach that we take to invest in and finance and stuff. Exactly. You know? so exactly. Just take your time, you know. Right. Right, 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 right. Right. And know who to call when you buck your toe. Exactly. Right. exactly. <laughs> All right, next question we yes. have. Right, so from Bossology, um, what are the health benefits of drinking wine? Which is better for your system, red or white? And can you drink too much wine? <laughs> uh, so you can drink too much wine. And I should say that we do encourage responsible drinking uh, because you can get, you know, inebriated um, from drinking wine. It really depends on your tolerance level. Uh, so a glass of red wine is encouraged because red wines contain resveratrol, and antioxidants. Uh, before you subscribe to the drink a glass of wine per day uh, prescription, one should consult their physician to ensure that they are in a condition that allows, you know, physical condition that allows them to have a glass of wine per day. But that is encouraged where you're able because of the antioxidants and the respiratory. Which um, so the antioxidants we all know, and then resveratrol helps with the blood and um, thinning, um, keeping the blood flowing. Now, um, as you ask about drinking too much, let me just encourage everyone. One of the reasons, or just advise, give a little um, note here, that many of us drink wines, um, red wines in particular, and we have we get a headache, and uh, it sometimes it is due to the fact that um, alcohol dehydrates us. So we do need to drink. You really should drink a glass of water per glass of wine. Uh, if you can't do that, then certainly per, well, yeah, per two glasses, you should drink a glass of water and we'll just leave it there. Okay. But, but you do need to keep hydrating. 
and uh, and drink water as you're drinking your wine. Okay, great. I didn't know that about the dehydration. That's right. that's definitely you know that's news to me. But that's good. That's that's good. But any any alcohol will dehydrate you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you do need to whatever you're drinking, you need to drink water in right. between. Okay. And then the last question is from Jacqueline Bryan. She asks, "How do you, um, how do you, uh, I can say how or how do you do wine drinking for vegans?" How do you do wine drinking for vegans? So you would need to know that um, there was no uh, no animal products used in the finishing of the wine because um, there's a there's a part a part of the process that they may use egg whites for fining because the egg whites attract um, the particles and they'll use that you know to to find the wine so. One, you would have to either go on the website or speak to the distributor uh, to find out what wines they have that are vegan friendly. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Deborah. It was a very, very informative session. Um, you know, the questions were great also. Um, we have a giveaway courtesy of the Wine Lady Deborah and Select Brands. And as we had said from the top, you know, the, the, the winner is going to be chosen from one of the registrants. You have to register. So we've had many, many registrations and we've chosen a winner. No, the, the, I have to put a disclaimer that I did not choose the winner and this person is not related to me. This is pure coincidence. I, <laughs> I am in, this, honestly, this is pure coincidence. So the winner is Cassandra Gale. And again, no, no relation. I don't know this person. It's not my wife, even though today is my anniversary. Happy anniversary, babe. I promise. It's, great. it's not just Chris Andrew. It's somebody else. So, all right. So we've come to the end of our... Um, oh, and so Chris Andrew has won this Rufino Pino Grigio. Pino Grigio, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. courtesy of select brands so VM Wealth will reach out to you um, Chrisandra and will coordinate with you to get you your wonderful bottle of white wine and is that uh, it's not champagne right no it's a part of Italy so okay, no, I, I know, I'm not, I'm not going to put myself on the spot but it is a, it's a Pinot Grigio alright yeah. so so yeah, so that's all that we have for you guys today. I wanted to thank um, a number of people, thank the VMware's marketing team. I want to thank Sharon and Ashley and the team in particular. I know she probably they, they didn't want me to say their names, but I, I just did. Um, I want to want to thank our digital media partner, Esserum. We also want to thank um, Select Brands and Deborah and Wine Lady Deborah for her wonderful presentation and all the, the knowledge that we just got want to thank um, Peter Gay for her gems that she brought to us earlier, even though she kind of took a broadside against Finance Twitter JA, but we're not going to that against her. I want to thank Finance Twitter JA, um, because all, all of the, the Finance Twitter JA folks tuned in. We want to thank you know, all the members of the Victoria Mutual Group for providing support to help to make this forum a success. Um, thank you, uh, the audience, for tuning in and for joining us and for submitting all of your questions. Sorry we didn't get a chance to get through all of the questions because time is limited. But you know, if you have any further questions, you can reach out to VM directly. Um, to, uh, if you want to speak to an investment advisor or just ask general questions, you can send an email to wealthinfo at myvmgroup.com. And that's wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, info, I-N-F-O, all one word, at myvmgroup.com. Um, the next Wealth Talk is in November. And my, I, I, again, I am Mark Gale. You can find me on Twitter at Mark Gale. You can check out our hashtag, <laughs> hashtag finance Twitter JA. You can come and contribute and you can learn. This is Peter Gay Russell Pierre. That's correct. And my cell phone number is 876-551-0058. That's 876-551-0058. You can shoot me a WhatsApp, you can send me a text message, you can give me a call, and I will, will definitely be in touch if it is that you require further information, if you want to open an account with us here at BMW, 
I will definitely be of service. Okay. You have an email? Sure, it's a little bit long. Okay. Because I don't know about your name. Okay, okay, all right. But it is Peter Ifen Gay, that's P E T A Ifen G A Y E, period R U S S E L L Ifen P E A R T at myvmgroup.com. I did say well, yeah, that's true. Long. You are just that. right, right? And it's true, it's true. You know, it's true, it's super fast. Yeah. I gave her the phone number, I'm going to pass it in the <laughs> uh, what, what, what have it, right? So if you want you to turn directly, you can either WhatsApp her, call her, or you can, you know, email her. Mm-hmm. All right, so thank you guys all for tuning in. Um, yeah, I mean, you, VMWealth, creating these wonderful um, forums for us to all learn more about finance, we, we learn about wealth, we learn about wine, we learn about, you know, Pinot Grigio, we learn about all the, you know, pronunciations, we learn about port in Portugal, we learn about, you know, all of these, France, uh, France, France. and Champagne <laughs> and Italy and all of these, you know, wonderful things. So thank you all. Thank you, Deborah, again, um, Select Brand. Thank you. Uh, thank Bye. you for your All right. Take care, Deborah. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.